you know, we're Pentecostal people here. I was a Baptist for the first half of my Christian life, and I never heard of the spirit of Jezebel. Never. And then when I started poking my toe into the pools of, you know, the gifts of the spirit and prophecy and things like that, it seemed like there was an avalanche, and everywhere I went, spirit of Jezebel, spirit of Jezebel, spirit of Jezebel, spirit of Jezebel. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I had some ideas about that. And if I'm being transparent, I thought it was a little bit overplayed. I thought it was a little bit overstated. I thought things were constantly being called Jezebel or the spirit of Jezebel that I wasn't real sure if that was true or not because it was the same things we saw in the Baptist church. To me, it was just flesh. But I was a little bit of a reluctant um, endorser of the reality of the spirit of Jezebel until I met her. Until I fought her. Until she about killed me on a couple of occasions. And is it still an overplayed phrase? Probably. But don't let the fact that it's overplayed cause you to dismiss it altogether. Um, there is nowhere mentioned in scripture the spirit of Jezebel. It is an, an inferred teaching. Jezebel was a wicked woman. You'll find her story in 1 Kings chapter 16 through, I think, around chapter 21. She was a, <clears throat> excuse me, a pagan princess. She was the daughter of a pagan uh, king and priest. And she intermarried with the Jewish king Ahab. And when she came into the national life of Israel, she brought all her pagan gods into Israel. And they established them via government so that the nation of Israel, which was supposed to be monotheistic, worshiping one God, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, really embraced on a broad, un unrestrained scale these false gods. And those false gods... In the minds of those ancient Hebrews, those false gods were more fun to worship. There's young ears in here, so I'm not going to go into graphic detail, but there was a whole lot of sensuality and practices that were offered up in these pagan shrines and these groves as people, people of the covenant, people in covenant with Yahweh, the Jews, uh, would go to these other shrines and altars and they would worship these pagan gods that Jezebel had imported and they would kind of, um, some of their sacraments were highly sexualized. And so Israel became detestably compromised. And Jezebel was a woman in national history of Israel. One of her primary things was to silence the true prophets of God. To literally have them killed, to silence them through intimidation and manipulation, to get them into a place where they could not prophesy the true word of the Lord, either through intimidating them or through executing them. And so the nation, and under, under her using her spineless husband, she used his authority, manipulating him to work what she wanted all throughout Israel. So when you hear the spirit of Jezebel, I think the primary thing I want you to think about, there are many things we could focus on, but I want you to think about the spirit of manipulation. Sometimes when we use the phrase the spirit of Jezebel, we're talking about a person operating in a, a certain atmosphere, a certain behavioral model, a certain kind of even temperate or personality. But I want to make sure I'm clear on this. I believe that there are Jezebelian spirits, demons, who facilitate some of the very same things that Jezebel did in Israel. And Jesus is going to talk to an ancient church. We've been studying the seven churches. And he's going to talk to this church at Thyatira. And what's very interesting is he's not primarily talking to the Jezebel lady. He's talking to the senior leader in that church who was tolerating her presence and to the church at large. So this rebuke, I feel like a bullseye right now, this rebuke is broadly to the church, but specifically 
to the angel or the messenger. He would have been the primary leader in that house. And the rebuke is crystal clear. So let's learn from this as we talk about unholy tolerance. There's a new religion in America, and it's the religion of tolerance. We, Jesus followers, are commanded by our culture to tolerate everybody and everything, and yet, ironically, they won't tolerate us. It's a false religion, and it has many altars in government, has many altars in education, has blasphemous amounts of altars in entertainment. And all around us, we have these tolerant altars that we're supposed to bow down on. And part of the reason why the church is not exactly in the strongest position as she could be in is because we have, we have become a very tolerant people, thinking wrongly that if we tolerated unholiness sinfulness and we would win their hearts and loyalty then we could move them into what they should be living in the spirit of god the truth of god the kingdom of god but it's been an unmitigated disaster what happened instead is as we tolerated them big we here big c church in america as we tolerated them they didn't come in and become like us we became like them which is exactly what happened in ancient Israel, which is exactly why this tolerance is unholy. Revelation 2.18, Jesus Christ is speaking. He is risen. He is glorified. And he says, To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire. We sang that a few moments ago. And whose feet are like burnished bronze. And here's what those words from the Son of God are. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, And is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. So you've got physical sin and spiritual sin coming from this one woman in the ancient church at Thyatira. Verse 21. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Now listen to your Savior talk. Behold. I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. It's got to mean something. Have you ever wondered what does that mean? I will give authority over the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces. Even as I myself have received authority from my father, and I will give him the morning star. And then Jesus closes these letters with the same statement we find in verse 29. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So I, I, I want to start at the last verse. We need to hear what the Spirit, Holy Spirit, is saying to local churches. We need to recognize that the Lord Jesus still sees local houses of assembly. He's still very well aware of knowing who's in them, the good, the bad, and the ugly about what's going on in them. And occasionally, as we found in these letters, he wants to address those churches. One of the reasons we corporately pray here every Tuesday from 4 to 8 p.m. and every Sunday morning from 9.15 to 10.30 a.m., those are our two main gathering spots, is collectively we want to submit ourselves unto the Lord, open up our collective heart as a local faith family, and we want to say, Lord, what do you see here? Sometimes it's affirmation and encouragement. Sometimes it's, you're doing well. I like that. 
And there have been other times where we have been in times, especially on Tuesday nights, in lament and repentance, crying out because we sense the Holy Spirit saying, the lukewarmness has got to go. The bitterness has got to go. The reluctance to sell out for Christ has got to go. So we step into the presence of the Lord by faith because we believe that our king still communicates to local churches, just like he did this church. So let's walk through this. He opens up and clearly, just hear me on this, the focus of what he says is to primarily one individual. He says to the angel in the church in Thyatira, or Thyatira, he, he, he addresses this individual described as an angel. We know that this is not an angel like Gabriel or Michael or others. This angel is the Greek word angelos, and it means a messenger. John the Baptist was called the angelos of God. We have others that Jesus would send forth as the angelos. These are the 70 and the 12. Messengers of God. Those that were established by God to speak the truth to a certain appointed people. And Jesus resurrected as he's going to address what's going on at the church at Thyatira. He says, I want the messenger of Thyatira to hear me. Doesn't mean everybody else didn't need to hear it. They all heard it. But I can tell you as as a leader, when we're talking about the spirit of Jezebel, like we're going to talk about, there is such a sense of responsibility, the fear of the Lord on it, that when you are the stopping point, the buck stops here, man, the buck stops here, daughter of God, when you're the person that is, can I say it this way, to a certain extent in charge humanly, of the primary trajectory of a group of people or a ministry, the Lord says, I put you there, and part of the reason I put you there is that you would never tolerate the advancement of what offends me. You'll see why this is so important in a moment, because if it's tolerated, it metastasizes. So, now that I have our attention... He goes on, he says, okay, messenger, here's the the beginning of it. And he describes what I call his fiery position. He says, these words are coming from the Son of God. It doesn't get any higher than that. It doesn't get any more serious than that. There's no greater authority than that title, the Son of God, God the Son. And he describes himself as having eyes like a flame of fire. This refers to the way he appeared in chapter number one. He says, showing himself again in this way in chapter two. And feet like burnished bronze. A lot of symbolism here. A lot of picturesque language. Fiery eyes from the Son of God whose feet are like burnished bronze. You've got a lot of different smart people that I've read and like, what is this burnished bronze? But there's a certain type of, of refining and shaping bronze that it's placed into a high heat source. And sometimes it literally begins to glow bright, fiery, white hot. And when John saw him, he's got the flame of omniscient discernment in his eyes, meaning I see everything perfectly. And then his standing is standing upon pure, absolute truth. The reason why Jesus is saying this is because he is about to command repentance in this church. And he's saying, I'm not suggesting it. I'm God the Son. I'm coming to you. And I want you to know that I'm not misreading anything. Verse 19. Thank you, Jesus, that he starts off really encouraging because he says to this messenger, I know your works. I know your love. I see your faith. I'm pleased with your service. I'm amplifying here. And I've watched your patient endurance. And in the end, you're finishing better than you began. Who doesn't want to hear that from Jesus? Who wouldn't like to be a part of a church where Jesus looked and said, I've been there with you. I've been watching. I've been moving. I've been there in the midst of your worship gatherings, your prayer meetings, your leadership gathering, all of your home posts. I've been there on the mission field when you're sending people forth. I've been there in the offerings. I've been there in all of the discipleship and prayer meetings in the Caneo classrooms. I've been there. I know your works. And I see your love. When I see you, I don't see the mechanical movements of the church at Ephesus. 
I see a heart that is on fire. I see your faith. You really believe me. And I see that your service, you're not a spectator, sit in a chair, believer. But you're serving and you're sacrificing and you're paying the price because I see your patient endurance. When you're enduring something, it means it's heavy or it's pushing back on you. And Jesus looks at the messenger and he looks also, I think, by application at the whole church. And he says, you are actually doing better with all of these things now than when you first began. And to hear that affirmation from the Lord is beautiful. He, he doesn't stop there, though. Because verse number 20 is, uh, again, one of those hinges. The whole thing swings on this. He says, but I have this against you. Now, I don't know the way you're wired, but we do live in a generation where people crave affirmation, but they're allergic to correction. And offenses are so accessible these days. And so part of the tolerance of the modern church is, and this was literally taught, it's even propagated by some mega church pastors here in metro Atlanta, like don't ever talk about sin. Try your best not to go detailed into the gore of the cross and the blood sacrifice. Don't challenge people on their lifestyles. Make sure that people know ultimately that the, 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 the message of the gospel and the kingdom is just about love. Well, I want to affirm the message of the kingdom is about love, but it's not just about love. And, you know, when we promote salvation, come to Jesus and be ye saved. Very few people are, are willing, it seems, these days to, to include this little disclaimer. Saved from what? Be saved? Yeah, go to heaven when you die. For real? Yep, just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart. Call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And you go to heaven when you die. And so there is this, this half gospel that's being preached. And people put their trust in this half gospel. But don't even have the, the honor of hearing why they need to be saved. What they need to be saved from. Why? Because we don't want to run people off from our churches and we don't want to come off judgmental and we don't want to act in ways that might offend people. Well, I, I just want to go ahead on, on the record in case you haven't heard. The gospel is offensive. The gospel tells you straight up, you're dead in your trespasses and sins. You, you're dead and you can't save yourself. You're dead and deserving of eternal wrath because the thing that made you spiritually dead was your treason against the highest law in the land. And if you don't accept his rescue on his terms, you will be eternally dead, always dying, but never actually fully dead. People don't want to go there because it's so much easier to get people to walk the aisle and say, Pray this prayer with me, shake my hand, get water baptized, make sure you start tithing and attending, and we're all going to be great. And then when troubles come later on, and persecution and loss and stumbling blocks happen later on, that little half assessment to the gospel where everything was bright and beautiful and cool and wonderful and comfortable and cozy and cocooned and sheltered and well-oiled and happy, that's what they believed. And then they found out, oh, Jesus didn't make all the bad stuff go away. And they get offended. Well, when Jesus is coming to them, he's saying, I'm going to have to tell you the whole truth. And messenger, I love your works. I love your love. I love your faith. I love your service. I love your patient endurance. And I love the fact that you're, you're killing it at this part of your race compared to when you began. You're doing great in these areas. But I have something against you. He, he literally says, I have a problem with you, sir. Um, it's no small thing for Jesus to look at a church and specifically to the primary messenger of that church and to declare, I have a problem with you. I don't know where you are in your journey with Jesus, but that makes me sweat a little bit thinking about that. 
Um, I know I'm saved. I know my sins are forgiven. I know it is all under the blood. But that is what I got. And I am not my own. And my response to this such an immeasurable, inexhaustible gift of eternal life, the response required of me and of you is that we are no longer our own. We then live our lives for him. And so our lives are for his pleasure. Our lives are for his glory. And lest you, you get off track, when you live for his glory and his pleasure, that is the most pleasing thing that you will ever experience in your life. They're not opposed to each other. Like the most satisfying way to live is to live for the glory of Jesus Christ. You find your purpose. You find your meaning. You find a, a, a different kingdom that you're more aware of than this temporary kingdom. So if he says to me, I have something against you, Jeff, I melt a little inside. Because I know I've done something to break his heart. I know I've done something to displease the one who took his pleasure in dying for me that I might be with him forever. So let's go there. Here's what he says. This messenger, and some in this church, not this church, but in Thyatira, they're being called out for tolerating Jezebel. He says, you tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. So again, Jezebel, this ancient pagan princess, the daughter uh, of the king and the priest of Sidon, she comes in and she establishes this foreign god worship, literally demonic entities taking the form of pagan gods, they're literally demon worship and brings it into the people in the covenant of faith. And in order to succeed at that, she had to eliminate the true prophetic voice in Israel. And so, by the way, thank God that there was a remnant. Elijah was the primary spokesman. But even the spirit of Jezebel on Elijah, that mighty prophet of God, sent him into a near suicidal tailspin. So we're not messing around with something that's kind of cutesy and clever and novel. We're talking about high-level demonic stuff. And how does she operate? She operated in intimidation. She operated in persecution. Now, in Thyatira, maybe just leave that verse up there, that last one I read, that you tolerate that woman, Jezebel. Just leave it up the screen so they can reference it here. First of all, she self-titled herself, I'm a prophetess. Uh, scholars debate whether or not A, she was truly saved, or B, if she was lost, or C, if she was truly saved and had a valid prophetic gift, or was just a complete, off-the-rails, power-hungry seductionist, seductress. I, I don't know what the answer is, but I do know she's very bad news. And so she gets into her position of influence through a prophetic gift, that the people in their day, many of them, not all of them, but many of them in Thyatira were ignorant. They had no discerning of spirits. By the way, that is a charisma, is a charisma. A gift of the spirit is to discern other spirits. There are people here in our church that don't look happy all the time when everybody else is getting their worship groove on. And, you know, and you'll, you'll look at some of the prophetic people and they're, they're like, their hands on their head, they're like this. Do you know what's happening? I talk to them. I, I'll go to them. If I see them, I was like, what's up? Like, there's a bad spirit over here. It doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit's not moving. It's just that in the midst of all the Holy Spirit activity, there is also a counter spirit. And people with that discerning of spirits, and by the way, I think you can pray for that gift and receive it, um, they, they get grieved sometimes, but most of the people now, as then, would not have noticed. And so this prophetess has a teaching ministry. So here she is, Jesus calls her Jezebel, I doubt that was her name. He's importing the character of ancient Jezebel and putting it on this woman in order to give a very clear, und undebatable view of what this woman is carrying. He's in essence saying she is operating in demonic spirits under the cloak of being a prophetess of God. And what she is teaching results in the seduction of God's servants 
to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. So let me give you just a little bit of it. I don't want to get too detailed because the Bible actually doesn't give a ton of detail. But the end result, the fruit of her teaching was that she's operating in a quote unquote deeper knowledge that probably only she has and those to whom she imparts it. And she sees things that you common people just don't see. And by the way, I have a little understanding as I've been getting revelation from the Lord. We are Christians and it only matters what's going on in our spirit. So it doesn't matter what we do with our body. Therefore, take as much pleasure as you want in whatever form of body pleasing you want. Because after all, faith is about the spirit. And the end result of that is that she's leading people, according to Jesus, who's got eyes like fire and doesn't miss a thing and doesn't exaggerate. She's leading people prophetically through her teaching to engage in sexual fornication. It's very much of what's happening in the church today. I mean, if you look at some mainline denominations, I saw an interview the other day with a very bold Christian talking to a very committed lesbian Methodist preacher advocating for abortions. She had her collar on and this guy's talking to her and he just looks at her and he says, because she is going off on why lesbianism is okay, why homosexuality is okay, and why Jesus is in favor of abortion. And she's just going on and on. He just looks at her and he goes, ma'am, you are straight up Jezebel. And he's right. He's absolutely right. Why? She's got a position speaking prophetically with authority about issues that are leading entire congregations into the depths of sin. By the way, I'm not poking at Methodists. This is everywhere. And then to eat food sacrificed to idols. What is that? That's not a biggie in our day. It was in the first century. Because you had these meat markets, literal meat markets, where if you want to go buy, you know, some ribs, they would slaughter that animal most of the time in an offering to a pagan god. And if a Christian knowingly ate meat sacrificed to a pagan god, Paul deals with this in a couple of places in his letters, that's sin. Paul said, you don't have to ask if it's been sacrificed to a pagan god, but if you know it's been sacrificed to a pagan god, do not eat it. He says it's a matter of conscience, it's a matter of saying I'm not going to partake in anything that I knowingly know has been offered in a pagan ritual. It's an issue of separation and sanctification. But not Jezebel. Jezebel's like, oh, pff, Paul, he's dead now. Let me just tell you something. That, that's a joke. We can eat whatever we want. Sure, I know that this was sacrificed to the Roman God such and such or the Greek God such and such. But after all, again, it's all about the spirit. It's not about the body. Do whatever you want to do with your body. So go ahead and take in meat that you knowingly, uh, that, you, that you know was offered to a pagan demonic God. And what this is, friends, is this is an extreme, what we, is a big $5 word here, licentiousness. License would be the word we would use. It just means that you're so spiritual that nothing physical matters, so you can sleep with whoever you want to sleep with. You can inject whatever you want to inject. You can look at whatever you want to look at. You can go wherever you want to go. Say whatever you want to say. It doesn't matter that you're saved and your tongue belongs to God. You can F-bomb GD. You can do all of that stuff. Why? Because it doesn't matter. It's all spirit. But the problem is, is God never separated who we are in our spirit from what we do with our body. But Jezebel, she had him hooked. Just a side note here. You can't help but to read her story and see how Jezebel manipulated manipulated and controlled her spineless husband. He had no walk with God. He was so compromised before he met her to the extent when his king Ahab's life was over, the record in scripture is no king was more wicked than that king. He did not start out that way. He married into it that way. And her influence even over her own husband brought the land into idolatry. So Christ leaves zero doubts concerning this individual woman. Her unholy teaching. Please know, she didn't just model this behavior. She imparted this instruction. She was very intentional. She's making disciples unto demons. And then the damning results of all of this is about to be unpacked. And let's go back to where Jesus began. He said, sir, angel of the church at Thyatira, 
primary leader and messenger, you're the voice and you see what's going on and you tolerate it. You let it go. Uh, let me bring it into 21st century here. You get to go whenever you're done, but I am not rushing this today. And I mean that. You can, if you've got stuff you've got to do, you get to go. Um, so, so the spirit of Jezebel always seeks to infiltrate houses, churches, ministries, even families, where there is a burgeoning move of God happening, where there is a pure prophetic potential, where the Lord has marked, let's just keep it in the realm of church, has marked a church to establish that church for his glory. And in order for that to happen, he almost always sends in and raises up from within sometimes individuals that will reform that church out of where it's been to take them into where he says they're going. And if Jezebel is already there, she's going to fight. Y'all don't get mad at me. She's going to fight like hell to get it to exterminate and extinguish. She is going to do whatever she can. And most of the time, the spirit of Jezebel and somebody operating in it, and by the way, here's another scary thought, a lot of people that are operating in the spirit of Jezebel don't know it. They've been in it so long, they have no idea. The devil doesn't come and says, I'd like to sign a contract, I'd like to fill you up with the spirit of Jezebel so I can wreak mayhem in the church. Most of them don't know it. They're convinced they're right. They're convinced they're prophetically more gifted. They're convinced that these poor people just need their help. And ultimately, they have a spirit of rebellion and mani manipulation within them. And so they're attracted to leaders. They like to get in close to the leaders. Why? Because if they can get that leader to become their Ahab, they can bring the whole organization or the entity down. See, Jezebel didn't go after the prophet. She went after the king. She went after her husband. And once she had his authority, she got to do whatever she wanted to do. So the spirit of Jezebel comes in and sows confusion. The spirit of Jezebel comes in and sows accusation. The spirit of Jezebel will manipulate to the core. And the spirit of Jezebel will fight to exterminate the voice of truth. The voice of authority. And in order to do that, that spirit prefers to work through people. They get close to the leader. And they ingratiate themselves to that leader. And oftentimes the leader doesn't know what's happened until it's too late. So, Jesus says to the leader, verse 21, he says, I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent, present tense. It's almost like Jesus saying, I gave her time to repent to this very moment. She still won't re repent of her sexual immorality. I, it makes me wonder, because he doesn't mention here not repenting about the food sacrificed to idols. Makes me wonder if she showed a little bit of outward repentance, saying, yeah, we won't go with the food thing anymore. But she protected that thing that was most dear to her. Uh, the Bible says that sexual sin is unlike other sins because when a sexual sin occurs in the life of a Christian, and particularly you join Christ to, King James language, to a harlot. When a Christian engages in sexual sin... There's no other way to say it. I want to be discreet here because of young people, but you, you, you bring the Lord into the bed. It's a repulsive thought. You bring the Lord into your computer room on your screen. You force Jesus to do things in you as a Christian or watch things through your eyes. He's in you. And... So sexual sin is the one that typically, if you get that stronghold, if Jezebel gets that stronghold in somebody's life, she can just about bring everything else down with it. So if, if, if you wonder why we are a church that is very vocal um, about these sins that are tolerated in our culture, it's because I actually care for your soul. Because I actually know that you're going to stand before Jesus one day, as will I. And give an account for the things we did in our body. And I've never met anybody that prospered as a slave to sexual sin. I've never met anybody that prospered who dabbled in sexual sin. 
Sexual sin is always a target of the devil to get people to fall to. But when Jesus says, I gave her time to repent, it seems like he's done talking to her. He's talking to the man who tolerates her. He says, I gave her time to repent. She refuses. Read Romans chapter 1 when you go home today and understand that when people refuse to repent, and by the way, she got into this church as a professing believer. Whether she was or not, we don't know, but she not only got into the church, but she had a position of influence and power and teaching ministry and maybe some spiritual gifts. She's right in the midst of it. She refuses to repent. So that means Jesus looking at her saying, I gave her opportunity to repent. Somehow he would have worked in her life to convict her, confront her, and she absolutely wouldn't do it. She had the prophetic power. She had the class. She had the ability to be able to train people to fornicate and eat things sacrificed to idols. She probably felt justified in what she believed and what she taught. And Jesus says she, she wouldn't listen to me. So here's where it gets tough. Look in verse number 22. He says to the, to the one who's just convicted of tolerating her he says here's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna throw her onto a sick bed doesn't that mess with your theology a little bit like jesus who welcomed little children up into his lap jesus who knelt down and defended the woman caught in adultery Jesus, the one who went and found Peter after peter denied him three times Jesus the one who was led like a lamb to the slaughter All of those things are part of who he is but I don't want us to ever forget that he's also the judge. And when somebody refuses to submit to his glorious, tender, loving, sacrificial, consistent leadership, when they will not come to him as a lamb, you will hear him roar as a lion. And his roar said to this about this lady, I'm throwing her onto a sick bed. I think it's interesting of where he threw her considering that she was the prophetess of fornication so the bed upon which she reproduced all of her error and evil would be the bed on which she died jesus said i'm gonna let her die right there in that place she carved out for herself so his strength and his ability excuse me her strength and her ability to influence was now going to be destroyed by jesus 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 said i've seen enough of this i i want to go ahead and tell you something Jesus never should have had to have this conversation. Why? Because that leader never should have tolerated. The leader should have dealt with it. The church should have dealt with it. The people of God should have dealt with it. But they wouldn't. Some didn't buy into it, as we're going to find out. But some did buy into it. But the main leader just looked the other way. And he tolerated it. He says, I'm also, verse 22, he says, and those who commit adultery with her, this is both physical and spiritual adultery. I think it covers both. Those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation. Um, unless they repent of her works. Have you, ever, have you ever considered that you may have to repent of some things you were taught? Jesus didn't say unless they repent of their works. He sees that these people were shaped, molded, influenced, and probably didn't know the difference between their left hand and their right hand spiritually and gave into it. And now Jesus is saying, once she's on the sickbed and everybody knows she's been judged, I'm going to give these people a time to, to repent of the things she imparted to them. Please know this, friends. Examine yourselves to see whether or not you be in the faith. Examine, do, do I know what I believe is true? Have I been taught error? Have I had possibly, and listen, I'm not trying to create paranoia. I'm just saying, look, my life is not mine. Like, I don't want anything in me that's not sourced in Jesus. And the nature of a Jezebelian spirit is that you didn't see it coming. Deceptive, manipulative, has enough Christianity sounding stuff to make sense to you. There's just a whole lot of Jezebel out there. Our pulpits are filled with people that tolerate it and carry her. He says, I'm going to 
Throw that verse back up there, please. Uh, Those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation. Jesus says, I'm going to shake you up for having gone there unless you repent. And then he says, I will strike her children dead. Let me tell you why this is important. I I, I take this with a primarily spiritual application. Um, This means... The spiritual children that had been birthed from Jezebel were now a second generation carrying Jezebel's evil and error. And Jesus says, I'm not letting it get into the next generation. I'm not going to let it permeate the next generation. I'm not going to let any more damage be done. So if I have to take them out, I will take them out. Now, you may not be comfortable with it, but I'm not comfortable with a lot of places in my Bible. And I just know this, if nothing else, this tells me how seriously Jesus takes the protection of his bride. Let's not forget, Jesus doesn't look at a church as an organization. He looks at it as a representation of his eternal bride. And when somebody is coming in on level one and threatening to bring a cancer into his bride, he tells that Jezebel, stop, repent, stop, repent. And she says, no. And he says, put you on the sick bed. And he says, anybody keeps trying to get in that bed, I'm going to shake them with great tribulation. And then Jesus says this, I'm not going to let my beautiful eternal bride be poisoned by another generation of this. I'll kill it all. There's not a godly man in here who wouldn't do the same thing for his wife if somebody was threatening to harm her. This is not hard to conceive. It's just uncomfortable because we've been taught for 45 years Jesus is sweet and nice and only wants our comfort zones. I'll remind you, this is the post-resurrection glorified son of God. This is who he is. He never changes. But people like to tell you, well, that's a different dispensation and I don't believe he would operate that way. No, no, friend. (laughs) This is your savior. And he says, I don't play. Verse 23 tells you a little bit of why he's going to do it. He says, when he does this, all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. And I will give to each of you your, as your works deserve. Jesus says, my name's attached to this. This is why I do this. Everybody's going to know who I really am. Not who Jezebel said I was. Not who to her disciples say I am. Not to who these apostates say I am. But I, I am who I am. And everybody's going to know who I am when they see that I don't let poison get in my church and turn a blind eye to it. And neither should that angel, that messenger of Thyatira. So Jesus declares that his intense, unapologetic resistance to the influence of Jezebel would produce a spreading fear of the Lord in Thyatira and other churches. I mean, early chapters of the book of Acts, Ananias and Sapphira bring a false offering to the Lord and die. Drop dead for lying to the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says the fear of the Lord hit everybody. Man, don't waste uh, an example that's set before you. You see all these big name people falling. You see all these Christians imploding. Try not to post about them online. Try to get in the secret place and say, God help me. God, help me. I don't want to waste somebody else's disaster. I don't want to capitalize on it. But I, I, I look at them and I see these men of God falling. It's like boom, boom, demonic snipers just picking them off. I'm like, God, help me. Why? Because I know if they could and he allowed it in their life, You may not like the sound of this, but I'm just being truthful. I could. My flesh is no more sanctified than Mike Bickles. My flesh is no more sanctified than Robert Morris's. My flesh is no more sanctified than Stephen Lawson. All of these names plus more. I don't look at them and say, huh. I'm thinking to myself, if you don't crucify your flesh and die, it will win. 
So let me finish up. Some of you are like, please do. Good Lord. So what about everybody that wasn't tolerating it? Look at what Jesus does. It's, it's kind of like a, a confrontation sandwich. At the beginning, hey, messenger, pastor, leader guy, I love your works. I love your endurance. I love your, your you're doing better now in these areas than you were at the beginning, like happy piece of bread. And then at the end, he's going to give another happy piece of bread to the, to the people. But the meat is confrontation. So he says, to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold to this teaching, who've not learned what some people call the, what some call the deep things of Satan. Oh, what? Let's go there. He says, to you I say, I don't lay on you any other burden. So he says, hey, some of y'all, this isn't for you. You're not cooperating with Jezebel. You didn't even understand that Jezebel was afoot and doing her work in the church. He says, I'm not going to lay anything else on you. I'm going to give you a few, excuse me, a few words in a moment, but I'm not going to lay any of this on you or anything else. He says, um, and he describes these people who do not hold to her teaching. So maybe they heard it. Maybe their red, you know, dashboard light went off saying, "Mm, check engine. That don't sound right to me. I don't see why I should trim off anything. We, we went through this here two years ago. And it wasn't just one person. I think it came in through one and activated all of the other that was hidden. And it about killed us. And at the end of it, there was two groups of people that I would talk with. One group would be like when individual names were known. One group was like, yeah, I knew something was up with her the day I met her. And another group was like, thought she was great. Never had a problem. Received from her ministry. That's the nature of it. It's the nature of it. Jezebel's crafty. She can cloak. And sometimes when she cloaks herself, the most discerning people will be like, something stinks. Something's wrong. Um, I will say this. Uh, the elders and I didn't tolerate it, but we caught it late. God help me, that'll never happen on my watch again. I learned some things. What is this deep things of Satan? A lot of scholars believe that Jezebel's prophecy class is involved. By the way, I have some special revelation and you need to learn from me because I know how Satan works. I've got the deep things and if you really want to overcome Satan, you need to be a part of the group that I'm leading and you will learn from me. Isn't it amazing? Jezebel projects. What's messed up in Jezebel, she'll protect on others. Uh, project on others. She, she, will, she will literally call out something in somebody else that doesn't exist, but through accusation and manipulation will say, boom! All eyes are then on that person who's the object of the accusation. And meanwhile, Jezebel's like, they don't even know it's me. Um... So Jesus makes sure here that his warnings to the guilty parties was just confined to them, that messenger and those that were in bed with Jezebel. And he's like, I don't want to cause fear or dread to hit you that have kept yourselves free from Jezebel's influence and Jezebel's doctrine and Jezebel's practice. So he gives them a word of exhortation and we get to leave on a happy note because in verse 25, he says to the rest of the church in Thyatira, Hold fast what you have until I come. I love that, man. That's like motivation for me. In other words, hey, y'all are doing great. You're doing good. You're not perfect, but my son is perfect. That's why your score is going to be perfect and my record's in heaven because he scored the perfect score and put it on your account when you trusted on him. But as you run, you're not scoring 100 all the time, but you're doing good. And hold fast what you have until I come. Hey, big boys, big girls, you're not done yet. 
you're not done yet. I appreciate how awesome you were in the early 2000s for Jesus. Hallelujah. You were rocking it back in 78 for the glory of God. You were breakdancing your way through the kingdom in the 80s. Can't touch this in the 90s. But you're not done yet. We're in 2024, and some of you are wearing a medal around your neck that hasn't been presented to you yet. You're not done giving. You're not done serving. You're not done praying. You're not done fasting. You're not done loving. You're not done evangelizing. You're not done discipling. You're not done paying the price. You're not done walking in holiness. You're not done going deeper. You're not done. Hold fast what you have gotten so far until he comes. That's the word for the church right now. Don't finish before you're finished. Hold fast. Don't let anybody take your reward from you. Why? Verse 26. The one who conquers, now we're getting to my language. I type A, come on somebody. To the one who conquers and who keeps my works, when? Until the end. To him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself has received authority from my father. That is a whole boatload of both theology, eschatology, and ecclesiology. All right there. I don't have time for it, but let me tell you what he's saying. He's saying that all are in Christ, all that are in Christ, we are going to be empowered and graced to finish our courses, cooperate with that grace. And as you finish your course, not in um, tragic shame for falling, but in glory for finishing well, Jesus says, you're going to be on my worldwide dominion ruling team. That's what he says. What all does that mean? It means the son of God is coming back from his heavenly throne, going to establish a throne on earth. Satan will be incarcerated for a thousand years in the pit. During that thousand years where Satan and all the demons are incarcerated in the pit, glory will hit planet earth. There will still be people on earth who are not born again and they will be ruled and reigned. There will be a theocracy, a theocratic government. Jesus is the king and all of us that are finishing with him in this life will be ruling and reigning in authority with him. That's just a little much for some of you on a Sunday, but like in, in a certain way, guys, I mean, this, your whole life is an internship. We're, we're just getting ready for our job in the kingdom. So I'm happy if you're, you're rich and wealthy and beautiful. I'm happy. Good for you. But if you're living for that, bad for you. Maybe you're not rich. Maybe you're not beautiful. Maybe you're none of the things that impress this godless generation. But maybe you're convinced in your mind that you're going to kill it in this internship because when the real promotion takes place, you're going to walk in the global dominion government of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and you're going to rule in authority. That's, by the way, that's where it comes to pass where he said the last will be first and the first one. That's when he's talking about. Have you ever wondered when does that happen? It happens. I think it happens spatially a little bit during this time, but it happens in its full. Like the people ruling in the millennial reign in the kingdom of Jesus. I'm jumping. I'm getting excited. There are going to be people that you look at and you're like, there's nothing going on there. You don't know what's going on. And all these big shots strutting while they're sitting down. <laughs> Jesus is going to say, I am so glad you made it in. I'm glad my blood was effective for you. Back of the line. You were first on earth and lived for it. I don't have much for you in the kingdom. I'm glad you're here. Back of the line. Y'all don't like that. It's true. (laughs) Every now and then I just 
can, I don't know if it's even, can you pray in tongues without opening your mouth? Because I'm up here praying in tongues in my spirit. And then verses 28 and 29. And I will give him the morning star. Interesting phrase. And then Jesus says this again. It's almost like he's pleading with us. He's like, he's saying, you need to pay attention. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Just listen to these two verses and I'm about to let you go. Morning star. Jesus says, I will give him the morning star. If Jesus is giving the morning star, it must be something from Jesus. But actually, the morning star is Jesus. First, Second Peter uh, one nineteen. Peter wrote, we have, the more, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. And then if that left any doubt, in the last chapter of your Bible, in verse 16, Revelation twenty-two sixteen, 16, Jesus says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. So Jesus says, as we finish well, as we run our race, as we don't quit before we're done, as we don't assume we're done before we're done, as we persevere until either the day of our death or the second coming, Jesus says, in the end, I'm giving you me fully. You won't have to relate to him by faith. Like, some of you are so madly in love and sold out for Jesus, and we only know that much. Like, I've been studying the Bible 30 years. I know that much, maybe half of that. I know about that much. And when we cross into the fullness of our inheritance, Jesus says, in essence, now the good part. Here I am. I am yours. No flesh in between. No insecurity in between. No fear in between. No Jezebel. No Leviathan. No Python. None of these demonic, nothing in between, just me and you forever and ever and ever. So I'll finish by saying this. Stand to your feet. He's worth it. He's worth it. We sing he's worthy. I just started training myself about six months ago. When I sing he's worthy, I think he's worth it. He's worth it. He's worth everything you've struggled through. He's worth everything you're waiting on. He's worth you coming through on the good side of every demonic assault against your life. He's worth you when you feel nothing, you get up and praise him anyhow. He's worth your giving. He's worth your going. He's worth your grieving. He's worth everything that's been required of you just to sometimes kind of barely stumble your way at times through this thing called the Christian life. He's worth you not having all the answers but still going. He's worth Worth, of, worth you having to repent and say, I'm sorry, Lord, I did it again. He's worth everything. And if you don't quit before you're done, you're going to see him. And every single thing that we presently call sacrifice, we'll look back on and we'll say, that was not a sacrifice. Amen.